Financial Times are hosting a series of discussions on foreign policy topics central to the 2020 US presidential election. Uh, as voters confront different foreign, foreign policy worldviews, uh, the series convenes influential voices with distinct perspectives to examine issues with far-reaching implications for America's future. I would like to thank the Financial Times for the partnership on this programming series and hope you can join us for upcoming conversations on international trade and COVID-19. Uh, before I hand you off to our moderator and panelists, please note that this program is on the record, and that the Council is an independent and non-partisan platform. Uh, the views expressed by the individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. Uh, this program is part of the Leicester Crown Centre on US Foreign Policy. Uh, a generous gift from the Crown family supports all of this, the Centre's efforts and the development of digital resources to make the Council's foreign policy content accessible across all of our platforms. Uh, lastly, if you have a question for the panel, we'll be taking audience questions for the last 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, just enter ccga.live uh, directly into your browser, um, follow the on-screen prompts, and you'll be able to submit a question um, or vote on other people's questions. Um, with that, I'll hand off to our moderator, David Gardner, International Affairs Editor with the Financial Times. Hello, good evening to you all. Um, thank you very much for attending. My name is David Gardner. Um, I'd like to welcome our distinguished panel, none of whom need any introduction from me, and their full bios are on the Council website. Uh, Martin Indyk, Distinguished Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, um, who served in several administrations, going back to Bill Clinton, Ambassador twice, I believe, in Israel. Karim Sajad Ford, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Relations. Tamara Coffin with Senior Fellow at Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution. We have limited time, so let's, let's press ahead. Now, the Trump administration has been notoriously erratic with its policies in the Middle East and left something of a vacuum in the region, in my view. Occupied, to some extent, by Russia, Turkey, Iran, and albeit cautiously, China. Not the first time that an administration has wanted to pivot elsewhere, but this is a region which keeps sucking in policy time, resources, and forces. Uh, in the case of the Obama administration, I believe Philip Gordon the other day was saying that pivot to Asia, hmm, nice idea, but 75% of the meetings in the Situation Room were on the Middle East. This seems unlikely to change whoever wins. Do you agree, panelists? I'll start with you, Martin Indy. Well, thank you very much, David. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be appearing, uh, Zooming with the uh, Council on Glo Global Affairs. Uh, I actually don't uh, agree with that. I do think that the pivot, as you call it, but the refocusing of US uh, interests and policy uh, on Asia uh, has been underway for some time. It started in the Clinton, uh, excuse me, in the Obama administration. It's being continued in the Trump administration. And whether it's uh, President Biden or President Trump, I think it will continue uh, for the next four years. And that's essentially because of the rise of China and the growing bipartisan perception of China as presenting a challenge, if not a threat, in some regards to American interests, combined with a war weariness uh, about the Middle East, a sense that nothing good comes from major investment of American blood and treasure as evidence in Afghanistan and Iraq. A uh, retrenchment that has been going on, started by Obama, but continued by Trump. And a downgrading of the importance, and some we can get into if you like, but downgrading of the importance of the free flow of oil from the Middle East um, because of the change in the oil markets and uh, in particular, America's development of its own independent uh, oil production and fracking, which has enabled the United States, in fact, to become an oil exporter. 
Uh, and so, of course, there are caveats to all of these, but to put it simply, I think that's a process that will continue. And the, the siren song of the Middle East uh, that uh, has attracted previous uh, administrations and presidents is likely to be more resistant uh, in the future uh, than it has been in the past. Thank you very much, Martin. Karina, I mean, Iran in particular has elicited one of the most spectacular interventions of the Trump administration in at the beginning of this year, Baghdad Airport with the strike on Qasem Soleimani and Mahia Mohammed. Tell us what you think. Do you agree that this is a, a sort of magnet which is inescapable? Um, thank you, David, and it's great to be with all of you. I, I, I think Martin is right that if it is a Biden administration, their instincts will certainly be to look for um, foreign policy success outside the Middle East. Uh, I think the challenge will be that, um, you know, the Middle East is, is right now the, the source of really the greatest refugee crisis since World War II, uh, almost 50 million refugees, which is not simply a humanitarian crisis. Um, it has real impact, for example, on the future of the European Union. And you know, what we see in the Middle East is that the power vacuums which uh, are, are, are filled are not filled by Norway and Denmark and, and, and countries like that. Um, you, know, you look at the places to your question on Iran, um, the countries in which Iran wields influence, Syria, Yemen, Iraq, Lebanon, these are all countries which either are in the throes of civil war or experiencing real civil strife, you know, weak governments. And so I, I think it's, it's correct to say that there's virtually no popular consensus anymore in the United States for the US government to play a more active role in nation building in the region. Um, but, but I think that at a minimum, it means working with US allies to try to contain and counter um, the, the role of actors like Iran that are seeking to fill these power vacuums. Tamara Koffer, please, what, what, do you agree with, with uh, uh, this, this magnus idea that, that it's inescapable? I, I do think uh, my colleagues are, are right to say that this is a region that, uh, relatively speaking, matters less to the United States in its global strategy than has been true in the past, um, and that it is a region that has uh, a way of forcing itself onto the American agenda. But I think that it, the real challenge for the United States is that in principle, it should be able to preserve its interests in the region at a lower level of investment than certainly over the last 19 years of war. Um, traditionally, in fact, the United States has had a lot of influence in this region without such a heavy military presence or military investment. It's been through diplomacy and relationships that we've had that influence. Uh, and it would be great if we could do that again. I think the big problem is that our partners in the region, after uh, Obama's desire to pull back and after Trump's uh, erratic behavior are so uncertain about American commitments that they are going to be assiduously working to pull us into the region. Uh, and yep. so whether or not we can really form uh, an agreement with them on what we're trying to achieve, that's the challenge. So, I mean, the, the, the prospect may be, if, particularly if Joe Biden wins, of a re-engagement with diplomacy, um, what you say was, was, was one of the, the, the mechanisms, one of the, the, the tools before, so a shift not just in tone, but in substance. I mean, is, is, were he to win Biden, is he likely to re-enter an Iran nuclear deal that Trump unilaterally withdrew from? I mean, subject to Tehran abiding by the uranium enrichment limits in the JCPOA and all that. And would it be, do you think, expanded, to include the regional behavior of Iran, you know, the militias and missiles formula that they've been using with, with some success, 
or would that be kept separate? Martin Indy. Well, I'll um, defer to uh, Karim, uh, who is uh, the expert on the on these subjects, but uh, to try to set it up for him uh, and, and talk a little bit about the strategic uh, context of, of your question. And it does go to what you said in your introduction, David, about this kind of vacuum that American retrenchment leaves and the way it's trying to be filled uh, by Turkey and, and Russia, and, and you mentioned China as well, and, and Iran, of course. And I think that even though the United States uh, will continue, in my view, to retrench from the Middle East and put greater emphasis on diplomacy, as, as Tamara says, uh, we are going to be looking, as we have in the past, but unsuccessfully so, but we will continue to look to our regional partners to play a role. And uh, the role, I think, whether it's Trump or Biden, again, will be in working together to contain uh, Iran. And the UAE-Israel uh, normalization agreement is, I think, uh, above all, uh, a, a, a strategic consequence in this context. We've been trying to rely on Israel and Saudi Arabia mainly. Saudi Arabia has proved to be an unreliable partner to help to, to fill this vacuum. Uh, a, a out in the open alliance between Israel and the UAE that is based essentially on countering Iran, in parentheses, and Turkey. Uh, and, can I think provide a, uh, a, a more solid foundation? I don't want to exaggerate it, but I do think that, that you could imagine that whether it's Trump or, or Biden, that we look to that as the kind of uh, platform and to try to spread that, bring Saudi Arabia, a more reliable Saudi Arabia into, into that framework which is essentially a, a kind of US, Israel, Sunni, Arab uh, uh, axis uh, with Egypt and with Jordan uh, against uh, Iran. And I think that's the strategic context that uh, we could see the next administration trying to set up to deal with the challenge from Iran that Karim is going to respond to. Okay, uh, Karim, you're on. Thank you, David, and to, to Martin. So I, I see kind of three uh, camps within the, uh, within, among Biden's uh, foreign policy advisors. Obviously, one camp uh, advocates a return to the JCPOA on day one, a return to the Iran nuclear deal uh, on, on day one. And, um, you know, they feel that it was the United States under President Trump, which was in breach of an agreement which was very much working and we should simply go back to that. I think there's a second camp which argues that um, the few instances throughout history in which uh, the Iranian government has compromised is when it's subject to pretty significant pressure and therefore uh, it doesn't make sense to cede that pressure on day one where Biden to win and go back to status quo ante. We should try to use that leverage and sanctions and economic pressure, which is inherited from the Trump administration and try to negotiate both a broader and a longer agreement. What that means is bro broader encompassing not only non-proliferation issues, but also regional issues and longer means addressing some of the sunset clauses. And then I would say the third camp, which seems to me just as an outside observer is kind of coalescing to be the largest camp, um, makes the argument that, um, you know, politically, it simply is not advisable for a Biden administration to begin its presidency with an escalatory crisis with Iran. Uh, you know, it's an administration which is going to be inheriting a pandemic, a major domestic economic crisis. And the last thing people want is another escalatory um, crisis and, you know, drawn out nuclear negotiations with Iran as we had during the Obama administration. So I don't think there's very, I don't think there's much of an appetite to try to renegotiate a tougher deal with Iran. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I think that um, 
they may recognize that um, simply a return to the status quo ante is perhaps not advisable either, as there were actually some senior Democratic members of Congress who weren't supportive of the Iran nuclear deal. So my sense is that uh, as an initial course of action, uh, the goal will simply be to de-escalate, to try to kind of freeze in place uh, Iran's activities in exchange for freezing of, of US economic sanctions, perhaps a, um, um, you know, uh, an elimination of some of the more onerous sanctions uh, in order to buy time for perhaps a broader negotiation with Iran. So I think it's kind of the marriage of, um, of you know, what's prudent um, in, in the context of domestic right. politics with prudence in, in the context of regional politics. Mm -hmm. Tamara. Yeah, you know, I, um, I appreciate very much the options that Kareem laid out, and I have no doubt that there's a robust debate, but of course, there's also the question of what the other side is willing to do. I, and I'm very curious to hear Kareem's uh, assessment of Iranian uh, policy and, and how you think they'll play this, Kareem. But I suspect that they're not going to make this easy for a Biden administration that's interested in a return to diplomacy. Um, and the kind of diplomatic coalition that would be necessary to achieve a broader, longer, stronger deal, um, the kind of coalition that Martin was saying, you know, he's hopeful about this broad Sunni axis plus the U.S. and Israel. I, I think that is exceedingly difficult to achieve. Um, President Trump was unable, despite doing a great deal for his Gulf partners, uh, he was unable to overcome the rift within the Gulf Cooperation Council, which is a major obstacle to Arab unity against Iran. And let's remember that the Sunni world includes Turkey and that Turkey is a NATO partner and Turkey is a neighbor of Iran. And so a strong policy to push the Iranians back into uh, diplomacy has to include Turkey. But we have Arab allies who have a pretty puritanical approach to the Turks and their role in the region. So I, I think assembling this coalition is not going to be a simple task. I don't say it's impossible, but I think it's not going to be the work of a day. Uh, and so I expect that, you know, I, I expect Crane's right that the first move will be a sort of freeze for freeze, let's de escalate. But getting past that, you know, that, that could take much of the first term. Okay, thank you, thank you. On the Israeli-Palestinian issue, on which two you certainly have <laughs> spent a great deal of time, um, Biden would presumably, I think, presumably push back against Israel's unilateral annexation of West Bank settlement, which the Trump did, Cedri has left, it's left a green light, but it's a sort of blinking green light. There are several problems here. I mean, one it would legitimize land grabs internationally. I mean, what, what, what could Russia, China, uh, India and in Kashmir, Turkey with its three enclaves in, 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 in Monza, what more could they wish for than, than, than this flouting of, 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 of international law? But on the other hand, I'm assuming Biden also, as, as Martin was referring to, uh, would want to build on Israel's entente with the, the UAE, but with something substantive for the Palestinians to hang on to that leaves them a real alternative to fighting for equal rights within one state and everything that that, that implies. Is there a realistic option here that, that, that a Biden administration might be able to uh, pursue. Martin, begin with you. Well, uh, I think first of all, uh, if you if you think about where things were left off in the Obama administration on this issue, uh, something that I was involved in, sure. uh, I think the conclusion of the people around Biden at the time, who are the exactly same people who were around, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, the people who were around Obama at the time are exactly the same people as around Biden now, was that 
that it was hopeless, that as long as you had Abu Mazen, the Palestinian leader, and Bibi Netanyahu as prime minister in Israel, there was no way in which you were going to be able to close the gaps between uh, the positions of, of these two leaders. And uh, there are a whole other, a host of reasons why it didn't go anywhere. But uh, for all of the reasons that Karim cited in the context of what to do about Iran, that's going to be even more the case with the Palestinian issue because of this really jaundiced view uh, of what could be done with these characters there. And, and so uh, I think that they're not likely, notwithstanding Abu Mazen's somehow wish that, that uh, something's going to be very different with the Biden administration, they're not likely, in my view, to make this a priority, that is to say, an Israeli-Palestinian uh, breakthrough to, a, to an agreement. I just don't see it with everything else that they're going to have. And, and this jaundiced view. Uh, but, the, and, and to speak to your specific question, David, about settlement activity. Settlement activity is something that uh, the Obama administration managed to get itself wrapped around the axle for eight years, totally unproductively. And uh, Tammy's nodding her head because she experienced that she was in the administration. And so, again, uh, I don't think they're, they're going to be interested in having a confrontation over settlement activity. Now, Trump has taken annexation off the table, and Biden has made very clear that he's opposed to annexation. So the question then becomes, what, it, what do you do about settlement activity, which is uh, bound to come back in what it's already beginning to come back? And there I think that, that uh, there is a, an opportunity uh, again, consistent with what I was saying about building on, on the normalization process that is now underway with the UAE and Bahrain and could, could spread to other Arab states. Essentially, like the UAE said, no annexation for normalization. It's quite possible to see that the uh, Arab states who might be prepared to normalize and particularly Saudi Arabia, would say no settlement activity for uh, normalization, no demolitions for normalization, uh, uh, allowing Palestinians to build in Area C. Uh, you know, there are a whole range of things that um, could be uh, linked to the normalization process that could at least get the, the next administration out of this kind of uh, pointless confrontation over settlement activity and yet freeze the situation until leadership changes on both sides create new opportunities. Okay, Karim. Um, did you see me, David? Yes, sorry, I beg your pardon. You know, um, well, I was all, I mean, this is a question to both Martin and to Tammy, um, which is if you're Mohammed bin Salman and um, you note how, you know, suddenly there is a popular momentum in Israel, which hadn't existed perhaps uh, a few decades, at least uh, enthusiasm about the prospect of normalization uh, with the Arab countries. Uh, Martin may have cited this, um, but something which I found striking, which was, you know, before the deal with the UAE, um, uh, uh, majority of Israelis preferred annexation, seemingly annexation to normalization afterwards, 80% supported normalization. So now that suddenly you have a momentum, uh, I'm just curious whether he thinks that um, someone like Mohammed bin Salman could actually try to be even more ambitious in, in terms of what he would get as a quid pro quo for normalization with Israel? Could he go back to the King Abdullah peace plan and try to get you know, a, a, a peace deal? Is that within the realm of possibility? So that's a question for both Martin and Tammy. And the only thing I'd add in the Iranian context about the, pros about the reaction to the uh, Israel normalization with Bahrain and the UAE 
is that um, on one hand, I, I think Iran's leadership has to be unsettled about the fact that now there is an Israeli presence in a place like Dubai, which has been their Hong Kong for the last few decades. You know, suddenly you could potentially have a Mossad presence, um, you know, being able to probe Iran's illicit financial activities. So that has to be unsettling. At the same time, Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, has always seen himself as the leader of the resistance, the leader of the anti-imperialist movement, and tried to um, portray his regional rivals like Saudi Arabia as simply Zionist lackeys. And so the fact that there's now open peace between some of the Gulf countries and Israel, I would say that you know, the Supreme Leader is probably happy about that because he feels that the average person in the Middle East um, is, is not supportive of that and eventually will come back to haunt these regimes who have made peace with Israel. That's a great point, Kareem. David, if I may, you know, I, I think, actually, we don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Mossad has actually been in Dubai for a while. Uh, they didn't need normalization. There's been intelligence cooperation under the table between the Emiratis and Israelis on Iran for a long time. Um, but it was very interesting to note that in the agreement that was signed at the White House, uh, was a provision to, uh, to open Emirati ports to any Israeli vessel. So if I were the Iranians, I'd be wondering about Israeli ships in Dubai, not necessarily the Mossad, which was probably already there. When it comes to Saudi normalization, I think you're right, Kareem, that the Saudis would need something bigger, something more than what the Emiratis got to make it worthwhile. Um, and I think it's an intriguing possibility that this, for the first time in 25 years, Israelis are actually optimistic about being, you know, accepted in the region. They're excited. They feel like maybe people are starting to understand them. They get a chance to go somewhere new, something that's almost magical to go to the Gulf. Uh, and also to use it as their uh, passageway to, to the rest of the world, um, connecting through the UAE. So I, I agree that that could create some leverage, but I think the way it would create leverage would be through Israeli politics. That I, I think Martin's right, that you're not going to see substantial change in Israeli policy until you see a change in leadership in Israel, and the same is true on the Palestinian side. And so... You, ha you have to see whether this public opinion changes the political equation in Israel, which right now is all about Netanyahu's failure on coronavirus, and it's boosting the Israeli right, not the Israeli left. The Israeli left is on its last legs. Um, finally, I... We're running out David, of time. David, if I... Just, to, to I'm a, sorry. Go ahead. The, the, you, 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 you said... Um, the Saudis would probably need something more in terms of normalization. It would, I think, have something to do with Jerusalem. What do you think? It would make sense to me, and I don't know whether what they would see as meaningful is something that the Israelis could give them. If they get something on Jerusalem, um, Martin, you know, tell me if you agree, it would probably come at the expense of the Jordanians, wouldn't it? Yeah, and that's the that, that's certainly what, what Jared Kushner was playing with, but I think that's playing with fire. I, I, just a couple of quick points, David. That First of all, uh, Mohammed bin Salman is in very bad odor on Capitol Hill these days, particularly with the Democrats and, and with the Biden campaign. I mean, Vice President Biden came out with a very strong statement on the second anniversary of the murder of Adnan Khashoggi, the uh, Saudi journalist, uh, in which he, he declared that there would be a cutoff in arms supplies to Saudi Arabia to stop the war in Yemen. Uh, so uh, MBS has a big problem in Washington, especially if there's a Biden administration. And his get out of jail free card is normalization with Israel. And so uh, Jerusalem, yeah, for his father and so on, but I suspect that we may see he's more willing to play this card than he is at, uh, at the moment if there's a Biden administration. And just one Lost. final... Yes. Forgive me. 
Yeah. Last time we moved to uh, taking questions from our audience. I mean, and you, you've actually, all of you brought it up. Trump has acted as a shield for not just Mohammed bin Salman, but Tayyip Erdogan. You know, it, it's almost inexplicable how, uh, uh, you know, you talk about get out of jail free cards. I mean, you know, Turkey has got away with busting Iran sanctions to a spectacular degree, buying a missile defense system from Russians, the S-400. The uh, MBS is not just, you know, this despicable murder of Jamal Khashoggi, but he starts flooding the market with cut price oil in the middle of a pandemic. Um, now, these two appear to be the only known uh, people on the planet able to uh, uh, conjure up almost miraculous bipartisan antagonism in the US Congress, where it conceivably, you know, uh, the Democrats might win the Senate too. The, 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 now, would you expect policy change towards Turkey and Saudi Arabia? Um, let's go in reverse order, just since you were talking just then, but tomorrow. Uh, on Saudi Arabia, I think Congress has expressed its will several times in a bipartisan manner. Uh, and the president has vetoed or used waiver authorities or emergency authorities to get around them. So Congress left to itself would already have changed American policy, specifically on the provision of arms uh, and the war in Yemen. Now, how far will that go if there's a White House that is not going to act as a shield? To me is uh, one of the big Middle East policy questions facing the next administration. If the Middle East matters less to the United States, Saudi Arabia matters less to the United States. Uh, Saudi oil already matters less to the United States and to global markets, partly, as you noted, David, because of Saudi errors in judgment. And, you know, if the next 50 years of the kingdom is going to be governed by a man who's as erratic and far more brutal than Donald Trump, then uh, I think American policymakers face a real question about how reliable a partner this guy can be. So I could see a real reevaluation, but I think at the beginning, there will be an attempt to come to an understanding on some core issues, including Yemen, including Iran. Thank you. Karine. You know, David, one of the questions I, I commonly get from people, including members of Congress, is you know, why is it that America uh, is allied with Saudi Arabia and adversarial towards Iran when you know, a lot of people think that in reality, the United States and Iran are, are, are in fact allies, but not friends and Saudi Arabia and the United States are, are friends, but not allies when it comes to some important regional issues. My answer to that is, is usually quite simple. And that is that the leadership in Saudi Arabia, now Mohammed bin Salman, um, they want to be allied with the United States. They very much rely on their alliance with the United States as a, as a keystone of their um, national security. Whereas the leadership in Iran wants the United States as an adversary for their own internal legitimacy. And I think if we were talking about a region in which, um, you know, it was countries which, um, you know, all of them were democratic uh, uh, countries with, uh, stable uh, governments and stable societies, um, you know, we may have the luxury of, of choosing to downgrade um, relations with, with countries which we're currently allied with. But my sense with regards to both Saudi Arabia and Turkey is that there's a whole host of challenges emanating from this region. And we need all the partners we can get um, to try to ameliorate some of these challenges. And my sense is kind of Tammy's last point, which is that I think the Biden administration will be forced to kind of hold its nose and, um, and continue the partnership with, with both Saudi Arabia and with Erdogan's Turkey. Thank you. Martin. I think that's, that's basically right. Uh, I just to in, um, part which we haven't addressed. Erdogan, if you could include that in your answer, forgive me. Um. Well, 
Erdogan is a difficult ally, like MBS. Um, they're two, <laughs> two peas in a pod. Um, but I think Karim is right. Strategically, they matter. Uh, they still matter. Saudi Arabia less. Tammy's right in that regard. But, but still, in terms of, uh, if, if think about trying to put together a Sunni Arab Israel US uh, axis of, to stabilize the situation, Saudi Arabia is a very important player in that. And, and so the question is can we reach an understanding? with these two leaders. Uh, can the next president, if it's Biden rather than Trump, um, can, can he reach an understanding with both of them about where our red lines are and what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not acceptable and whether there's a way to find some common, common understandings of, of proceeding. Um, neither uh, Erdogan uh, nor uh, Mohammed bin Salman want, the United, want an antagonistic relationship with the United States. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be very hard to work out uh, accommodations in which they respect our interests. And that's going to be the challenge. Uh, but, uh, and I, I don't, uh, for I can't predict that it's going to work because they're such difficult customers. But I think from the American point of view, we're going to try. I don't think we're going to go into confrontations with either of them, even though Congress may prefer that route. And the fact that Congress is highly critical gives the administration a certain amount of leverage to say, you know, you guys really need to get your act together if you want us to hold, hold the fort against uh, this kind of criticism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'm now going to move to questions and I'm going to select them. And please, uh, those who are listening to, to, to this fascinating debate, forgive me if I choose questions, which uh, I, I won't choose the questions, in other words, that I think have more or less been answered already. Okay. So, um, there are two in particular. How will China's growing influence manifest itself in the Middle East? Um, let's go in, back again tomorrow. If we could begin with you. Sure. Um, look, the, the Chinese are a rising power. They are investing uh, in their governmental diplomatic capacity in the Middle East. I actually was a guest professor at Tsinghua University a couple of years ago where they have their best students studying Arabic and Hebrew and Farsi. Um, they uh, are, however, kind of going e economics first. They want to be friends with everyone. And so they're trying very hard not to take strong positions in a region that, as we've been discussing, is just a maelstrom of competing actors. Um, that means they're stepping very gingerly. I think they have influence, um, and I think they are building friendships, but it's not clear to me that they're doing anything more than pocketing leverage that they might be able to use later. They are not interested right now, anyway, and I would say in the next 20 years, in trying to replace the United States in the region. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Karim, I mean, there's been much, you know, slightly hyperbolic, you know, comment about China, Iran, and all the rest of it. 25 years strategic deal and all the rest of it. I mean, so far as one can see, it's not so very different to, to agreements China has with Iraq, 20 year oil contract. Russia, 25-year oil contract and the rest of it. What do you think in, in, in light particularly of the, you know, Belt and Road, which is strategic, but, but it is very much, as Tamara said, cautious, step-by-step -step economic uh, uh, path. What do you think? Uh, Tammy is absolutely right that Iran wants to enlist China in an alliance against the United States and an alliance against um, Saudi Arabia, but certainly China is not interested in that. And for China, Iran is just one other partner among many dozens it has um, throughout the world. 
um, it has these um, transactional commodity relationships. And um, one of the things that Hillary Clinton did quite well when she was Secretary of State was to um, try to cultivate and foster the China-Saudi Arabia relationship in order to kind of wean China off of Iranian oil. And so the reality is that um, you know, China has close ties with, with, with Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries. And they don't want to enter, they don't want to take sides in the Sunni Shia conflict in the US uh, Iran conflict, you know, uh, much to Iran's chagrin, which hopes they can uh, become, you know, allied in this anti American alliance with China. Martin, just, I mean, you know, as, as, as uh, uh, Karina was saying, they, they have an enormous number of relationships managed, um, as does, if I can push you in that direction, Russia. Uh, uh, um, how do you think, if, if, if we might shift this to focus a little bit, how do you think Russia has done in, 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 in uh, the past five, six years? It's it, this subprime superpower, which has used Syria as a springboard back to, you know, top table, as an ostensible glo glo global power has always been seen before, even in times of the Soviet Union, as little more than a, than, than a spoiler. But now you hear the comments around here in the Middle East that um, actually they're slightly more reliable than the US and its allies in, 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 in Europe, which there surely must be a robust and withering response to that. What is it? Well, they have uh, military capabilities that can be um, thrown in to try to tip the scale. And where they've tried to do that, they have succeeded in Syria, uh, but they haven't succeeded in Libya. And uh, the, the Russians are definitely beneficiaries of this retrenchment that you started with, David, and uh, the beneficiary yeah. of hedging policies by the local powers, the regional powers, um, particularly the Emiratis and, and, the, and the Saudis and others have been looking around to see, well, maybe Russia can help. But Russia doesn't want to choose between them and, and Iran, um, much like China. And Russia doesn't have I mean, it's a player in the oil market, but we see where that ended up with a, a clash between <laughs> Russian and Saudi interests. Um, so there's, there's always been a limit to how influential the Russians can actually be in the Middle East. Uh, Henry Kissinger uh, discovered uh, when he tested the proposition just how weak, in fact, they were and succeeded in pushing them out through diplomacy, not through use of force. Uh, yes, the Russians are in, back in Syria, but in a sense, they were always in Syria. Um, and <laughs> Obama had this attitude was, you know, you're welcome to it. Um, but uh, they have managed to, they've managed to save the Assad regime uh, for worse for the Syrian people, unfortunately, but, but they've done that. And though, so they've sent a signal to other authoritarian Arab leaders around the region that they are, in a sense, more reliable than the United States, which played a, played a role in, in undermining uh, the Shah and then Mubarak and you know, all of our friends in the region. So, so in that sense, they're, they are seen as more reliable, but what they can actually deliver is not very much. So, and I think if you actually go around and look at, you know, what can Iran do? What can Turkey do? What can China do? What can Russia do? They're all basically constrained. They can't play the role of the dominant uh, power that the United States used to play. So what does this mean? It's the great game redux where everybody's gonna be maneuvering, including the United States, because while I say we, we're looking elsewhere. We still have interests there. We're still going to be engaged in some way or other. And so the, the real question is, where is the stabilizing force or relation, set of relationships going to emerge from all of this? And I still think 
that it's going to be, as I started off by saying, it's going to be a, some kind of Sunni Arab, Israeli, American axis. That's, that's where, where the stability is going to come from. Thank you. This, this was absolutely fascinating. I think we've run out of time. So um, much, that, much as I would like to continue. Um, I thank you to everybody who tuned in on, on, online. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, a recording, I believe, will be available on the Council social channels um, almost immediately and on the website very shortly. And uh, um, thank you all, uh, uh, Tamara Karim Mata. Thank you all very, very much indeed. And that, 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 that was thank you. thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye, bye, bye-bye.